Hi, and welcome to 10 Ideas 50 Years. I'm Jeff Cliff, and I'm trying to get across in this video series 10 ideas that I think that you should know. Today we're going to be talking about Bayesian inference, and in particular, uh, a paper uh, entitled Bayesian Inference for Psych Research uh, by one Ward Edwards, Harold Lindman, and uh, Leonard Savage. Uh, that was in the 1963 uh, Journal of uh, Psych or the 1963 uh, Psych Review Journal, of Volume 70, Number One. Uh, I guess research done at the University of Michigan. And uh, before I get into exactly what it is that they are trying to get across in this paper, I just want to point out exactly where this video is taking place and kind of the background of what its context is. And so this video is taking place in a place called Homebase, uh, at Homebase uh, on Twitter, uh, which is located in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and it, it is a hackerspace. So we are uh, kind of tinkerers and makers here, uh, people who are interested in doing experiments and learning about the world. Uh, we are all experimentalists, although nobody is currently in this room uh, watching this as it's taking place. Uh, but we, we are very much interested in uh, understanding what experiments we should be doing in order to understand the world, uh, the, the nature of evidence given from experiment and how we can best use it. And so the ideas presented in this paper are going to be very close to home here. And uh, so what this paper was kind of coming from was a that they were noticing and lamenting at the time that there was no textbooks for Bayesian inference in Bayesian statistics. And the, uh, there were people by 1963 who were using this method and who were dealing with questions in a Bayesian manner, and we'll get into the mechanics of that in, in a bit. Uh, but there was no kind of central place, central authority that you could point to and say, okay, this is what method you should follow in order to conduct science. The, there was a lot of things using classical statistics, uh, like your typical textbook at the time. You know, there were statistics textbooks at the time you could go and learn from, but there wasn't anything that contained these ideas. And uh, with my experience uh, as a person with a computer science degree, uh, even as far as 2002, this this material really never made its way into my. Uh, I guess classes, and regardless, it, it didn't at least percolate down to uh, in the you know 50 years years hence uh, down to the st statistics 100 level or the first year statistics course. It didn't percolate down to the computer science courses or any of the other science courses in general. And so this is, as of at least fairly recently, uh, not taught in universities, which is kind of surprising, uh, given that uh, the advantages to using it and to viewing statistics and the greater uh, endeavor of science in terms of it. And so, kind of as a background, the, I guess, Bayesian inference and, and using this, this, this direction as a means of approaching science is not actually new. Uh, as the, the word kind of denotes, uh, it dates to 1763 to Reverend Bayes. Uh, and there, there's kind of m multiple centuries now of people using the, at least Bayesian rule uh, in its in various forms, and so there, there's been a lot of smart people, uh, hopefully up to two in, including you, the, the viewer, who have looked at this and kind of picked through it and tried to make, made, not only make use of it, but kind of thought about the consequences of it. So there, there's a lot of background in terms of how this this, this method works, in, in terms of uh, a lot of people have combed through it and found that it doesn't, in fact, work, but the theory is sound, etc. Uh, but up until about the 19th, early 19th century, uh, this was kind of viewed as the, the, the way of doing statistics. But uh, there was a problem in that uh, some of the calculations start to get a little bit involved in terms of the busy work involved in actually uh, doing the, the calculating. And given that until about that point, there were no, there was very few, if any, calculators. There were no computers. Uh, and mechanical aids for doing basic addition and multiplication in large numbers of, uh, of iterations were not yet available. And so even for the people who may be able to 
you know, understand the value of it. At that time, it was not at that point practical. And it, e even if you were a large government or you know, kingdom or whatever, uh, and had the, the, the data that you, you would be able to you know, use this on, uh, the, the machinery was not necessarily available to you to use this. And so it kind of sat as an uh, unused until 1959, when a paper was published under the title Probability and Statistics for Business Decisions by one Robert Schleifer, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And up until, or from that point onward, it started to be used in the business and economics fields. Uh, and in particular, it was uh, not used in psychology, which is where they are trying to bring it in this paper. Now, if you have seen the previous video, you will know that up until this point in psychology, there was reasons for them to be uh, wanting to bring something like a new method for approaching data and how to deal with data to psychology. In that, the, the, at the ground level, the, the nurses were actually having to deal with theories uh, in practice and in, in how, whether or not patients were uh, actually becoming healthier as as they were being treated or whether or not the tests that they were being given were actually producing any valid output was something that was very much in question. So this was part of the attempt to rectify that and to bring uh, a, a better way of dealing with evidence and a better way of dealing with experiment uh, to remedy that situation. Now, again, before we get too far into the details, uh, it should be pointed out that uh, frequentists, or uh, the, the kind of stat statisticians that uh, you know, were, claimed, or were trained classically, which probably includes most of the viewers here, uh, and Bayesians, the people who follow the Bayesian inference, agree most of the time. And it's a good thing that they agree most of the time, because it means that both frequentists and Bayesians are mostly on the right track. Uh, and that it's mostly the boundary cases, the, the kind of oddball cases, where the any disagreement happens in general. Now, it should be pointed out, of course, you know, what, what's the point if they agree most of the time? Well, it, it's at these boundary conditions that the Bayesians have the advantage. And that there are particular examples where, and we're hopefully going to get discuss them a little bit, uh, as far as why uh, you would want to choose this method uh, as a general method of conducting science uh, rather than the, the classic one that you would probably learn to make. And so the, the idea of how to kind of view this is similar to how you can view Newtonian physics versus modern or relativistic physics in terms that this will actually give you a clearer picture, uh, but the classic method will also give you a pretty clear picture uh, this will just give you a broader or deeper understanding of that picture. And so their approach uh, was to walk through uh, a, a, a good deal of uh, statistics and how statistics was actually carried out in the field at the time. And we're not going to go through their entire, um, I, I guess, introduction to it. Uh, if you want, if, if you are a type of person who deals with statistics on a day-to-day -day basis, and you would like a reference manual to, to you know, conduct your affairs in this new way, uh, you may want to actually go and acquire the paper and read it. Uh, this video is not going to be a reference. It's just meant to be an introduction, a, a kind of walkthrough, a base, very, very light walkthrough of these concepts. And just to give another example, uh, uh, there are hypotheses that are rejected uh, by the frequentist side uh, that are the same hypotheses that are rejected by the Bayesians. Uh, but they are rejected on the frequentist side at the, at the point of analysis of variance. And I'm not going to go too deep into that, but the, the point is that at the, uh, at the Bayesian level, the advantage is that the hypotheses get rejected kind of immediately, and that you don't have to go to take any extra steps to reject them. 
another advantage of the Bayesian, uh, I guess, method is that uh, from the frequentist perspective, you can conduct an experiment and come up with a, a, a result from that. But the experiment itself does not suggest whether or not to repeat it, and whether or not the results of that experiment matter in practice, and whether or not you should, I guess, conduct another experiment of the same kind. Whereas you, as we will find, this is something that you will be able to gather from experiments conducted in this way. Another uh, advance around 1959 was not necessarily the, these particular equations that we're going to get into. And it's not that the Bayesian inference in general was new, but that they started to develop a context that tied all of it together. So they, they started to see not not necessarily a you know the Bayes rule as an individual you know, component, which Thomas Bayes may have seen it as, uh, but they begin to see it as a part of a larger framework. We're not going to describe the entire framework here, but just, it may just be noteworthy that, that this this is actually something that was new within the time period in question. Similar to previous videos, uh, they are going to view probability as consistent and orderly opinion. And so it's not just any opinion, but it's opinion that has to be consistent with itself and with other held opinions. Uh, and going back a couple of videos, when we discuss opinions and when we're discussing probability here, we're explicitly discussing, discussing subjective opinion. So this is not uh, opinion defined in an objective way. This is a, an opinion and a probability defined subjectively. Right? It is your opinion. It is an opinion to you, held by you. And walking kind of another step from there, inference is something that happens when you get new information. So when you get new information, something that has to happen is that if it is consistent with your current opinions, then your current opinions need not change. You can infer from that point that your opinions are continue to be valid, but if the new information causes inconsistency with your current opinion, your current probabilities, then you have to update your opinion and your probabilities to remain consistent. And we're going to show you how to do that. A way of looking at how much probability each opinion gets uh, is going to be defined in terms of how much you would bet on it. And so this is going to be, we're going to kind of show you how odds are calculated later on, but just at an intuitive level, uh, the idea of how to, I guess, understand whether to believe something is going to be very closely related to how much you would be willing to bet on that something, which is going to be very closely related to the, the, the particular odds you would place on them. Because of this view of how probability works, uh, this, view of this, this view of Bayesian inference was very easy to understand and very easy to pick up from the business community and from the economics world at the time. And so this was not a very large leap for them, and they did pick it up and use it. But the kind of greater scientific community, in particular the, the psych community, did not at the time. And so this was something that they were trying to, in this paper, bridge the gap. And so one of the things that they're going to try to claim here is that two people with uh, divergent, maybe even wildly divergent, prior opinions we're going to get into what priors are in a bit. Uh, but reasonably open minds will be forced into arbi arbitrarily close agreement with each other about future observations. So, so long as there's a sufficient 
principle a stable estimation in for an amount of data. We're going to get into how that works. They're going to make the claim that there's as many ways of doing Bayesian statistics as there are statisticians, and I guess by extension, scientists and hackers. This is a little counterintuitive because you're probably expecting, you know, especially if someone is saying this in front of a, a room full of students, that there's one method of doing it and that you must follow the method. And that the w merely expressing the idea that there may be different ways of applying these ideas may be a little bit counterintuitive, but it is nevertheless the case. Going kind of along the lines of of action and you know, who was using it, I mean, the people who were actually doing things in practice, the, the business or the operations people perhaps. Uh, by the 20th century, maybe early 20th century, there was a debate within the statistics community whether or not and to what extent you could be expected to act on information you gained by statistics and experiment, and how much of action justified by it was kind of out of bounds and improperly acted upon. And it does turn out, and we're going to get into to what extent, that you can act on statistical information and that the Bayesian method is going to tell us how. Again, you could come up with the, the same results from the frequentist perspective, but it comes naturally from this. A lot of the question is going to be, to what degree should you approximate before you can feel comfortable using your approximation? And to what degree can you, I guess, come up with a, an answer from your statistical analyses before you can feel comfortable using it? Again, this is something that's going to fall out by default using this method. Let's get into it. So, to start off with, just kind of a basic definition of conditional probability, which I think we may have covered in one of the previous videos, but just as a review, that when we say this probability, or P of D given H, or P of D type H, it just means the probability of getting D given H. So, the probability of conducting an experiment H and getting D as a result. And that probability is going to be definable as the probability of both D and H divided by the probability of H. And uh, so that's just kind of a basic statistic, or a basic definition, a logical definition. But this has the consequence of what's called Bayes' law, or Bayes' rule. is that the probability of H given D is the probability of D given H times H divided by D. Might be worth memorizing this. This is one of the kind of core ideas, not necessarily in this video, but that you'll ever come across. Uh, it, it is useful so long as this entire method is useful over and over and over again. So think about it. Now, in particular, you're probably going to want this probability of some outcome given your data and uh, you're not going to be you're, you're probably going to have some belief of your hypothesis 
before you do the experiment. May or may not be accurate, but you'll have some belief. So, you know, thinking about an experiment we could do, uh, we could, I don't know, drop this truck and it's going to have some probability that it's going to fall. It's going to be almost one. Almost maybe even close to one. Uh, and then, this probability that it would drop anyway, who knows, maybe someone would force it down. And then the probability that it would drop anyway, given this experiment, or this hypothesis. So that may be a little hard to conceptualize, but in practice, these two, and again, these are subjective probabilities, they're held by different, they may be different across different people. Uh, you're going to find that people are going to disagree about it. Uh, and this one is going to be disagreed in the context of that experiment, and this is going to be disagreements in general. People are just going to have different ideas of how the world works. But they're going to have less different ideas of the, the conditional probability between how the world works. And so the outcome of the experiment happening because of the experiment, or rather the, the outcome of the experiment determining the, the, the uh, conditions of the experiment is is going to be a, a lot less of a contentious issue. And in particular, experts are going to make their expertise based on these conditional probabilities. And we're going to see that a little bit in the next video. But one thing that's worth noting, you may have seen this before, uh, and this may even come up in first year stats classes. But what's not kind of told is that this is not necessarily even just a probability, but can stand in for a whole distribution of probabilities. And so, for example, you may have a prior expectation of some experiment or some hypothesis or some belief. where your belief falls or is definable in an entire distribution. And likewise, you may have a distribution that governs not just this particular the outcomes of a particular experiment, but also the behavior of the the thing that your your experiment is kind of built on. So if you're, again, the, the probability of if I drop a piece of chalk that it will fall, and the probability that it would fall anyway, uh, both of these may end up being definable in terms of entire distributions of what do we mean by fall, and how much is it falling, and at what speed, that sort of thing. You can, you can define distributions that determine the speed, you can define distributions that determine the probability uh, in different ways. And the notable thing is that this equation still governs the relationships between these distributions, and that this conditional probability also ties these two distributions, which are subjective, I guess, opinions, consistent opinions, to this resulting consistent opinion that is also a conditional probability, that is kind of a learned distribution. It is a distribution that takes the information that you start with, applies information based on the outcome of an experiment, and leaves you with a more, hopefully more accurate distribution. It's worth noting that these distributions can be continuous. It can be your typical normal Gaussian distribution. Uh, it could be discrete. Uh, the, this remains valid. If you can only express your distributions by a, perhaps a digital means, uh, it remains valid if your distributions are not uh, either of those. So, for example, if they are definable in, in some non-parametric way, so long as the distributions can be related and so long as the, the kind of basic relationships that allow uh, this relationship to hold can hold, they can be divided amongst themselves, etc. 
um, then this relationship will hold. It's worth pointing out that s some of these are going to be um, related to public information, and some of them are not. And so, for example, you may have a belief about the you know, probability that gravity is at a certain strength, but you know, and that your experiment will, will you know, if, if you drop this piece of chalk, then it will you know, drop at a certain rate, and that this will be dependent on the you know, rate of gravity in general. So the, the rate of gravity that is exhibited in your experiment is going to be determined by the, the rate of gravity in general. Uh, and but that you're, you're going to be able to look up that in, in some kind of a maybe Wikipedia or something like that, some kind of authoritative source. But there are going to be experiments that you're going to be able to do and, and beliefs that you're going to be able to hold that there is no authoritative place to find them, that you can only, your best bet is your opinion of it and that you can only update your opinion based on this law and based on experiment. You this H is experiment, and then you can separate out the B. Or rather, you can do H as a hypothesis, and B is the whole of the set of hypotheses. So you can do this with B. And some region within B will be which hypothesis explains B or is true. thing that's going to hold is this the probability of B is going to be equal to the sum of probability of B given H I for that particular hypothesis times the probability of that particular hypothesis. This is going to be useful in the cases where you don't start with a D or you don't start with the probability of B and you'll have to kind of generate it by hand. But this can be seen as the process of gathering data. And so, for example, you're going to be uh, coming up with your prior belief of that hypothesis and the probability of your you being in your experiment given that particular hypothesis uh, is going to determine you know, the, the sum of those two multiplied, or multiplied together uh, for each possible hypothesis including the hypothesis that none of your hypotheses are valid, which is a useful one to, to define, uh, is going to I guess, define your, your probability that you're in your experiment on this. Now it's worth pointing out at this point that if your prior prob probability uh, is zero, and it turns out that your experiment comes up with something for that for for that occurrence, for that belief, then this breaks down. So if you divide by zero, you get an undefined result. And so if your data that you come up with, your prior belief for that data is zero, you're not going to be able to reason about that. And so you have to be very careful when doing Bayesian inference to define your prior belief to be zero for something only when you're 100% absolutely sure that that something cannot actually occur. And so, uh, for example, suppose that you are, and this is an example given in the paper, Suppose that you are feeling kind of sick, and you feel you may have a fever. And so 
you have a thermometer and you're going to take your temperature with this thermometer. And this is a regular thermometer, you bought it at maybe Shoppers Drug Mart or something like that. And you expect that it's going to be fairly accurate, but it's not going to be perfect. Like it's not a scientific instrument. Uh, really, it, it's not uh, made to a very degree of precision or accuracy, but it's going to give you roughly your temperature. And so you're going to believe a distribution, or you're going to express some trust in it, depending what temperature it gives you. And you can kind of graph this amount of trust. So I don't know what the normal temperature of a human being is, but let's say it's 98. And then it's pretty accurate at 98. It remains accurate. So about 103, say, which maybe you have a fever, maybe that's fever, I don't know what the, the temperature of the fever is, whatever. But if you got a temperature of 5,000, you would probably take a look at the thermometer and go, I think this is broken. You might take it to your temperature a second time. But at that particular instant, you would probably not accept that value from that thermometer. Because I'm sorry, no matter who you are, uh, unless you're on fire, you, your temperature is not 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius or whatever. Um, it's just not going to happen. So your distribution of trust is not going to include 5,000. It's going to include something much lower than that. And it's going to look something like that. And this is going to be your distribution. And another key idea is that the all the values together are going to add to 100% or 1. And so even before you take your temperature, you're going to have a prior belief of what 1, what your temperature is. And then 2, this other curve of how accurate your thermometer is. And so the first thing to notice is that your thermometer is not actually distributed entirely, at least, among a normal curve. In that, you know, 5,000, the probability is zero. Like there, there is no probability that you are that particular uh, temperature. And so, uh, right off the bat, you're going to find that there's going to be a question of, you know, what kind of distribution does this thermometer have if it's not a normal distribution? And what can we learn from it, given that we have you know, this, this value from it. And we'll get a little bit more into that as we go. Now, it may be also kind of defining this concept of openness and closeness of mind. For the interval where we have expressed confidence is possible, in this thermometer. So for example, from, I don't know, maybe 80 degrees or 70 degrees, 110 or something in that region, where we would expect that if for some reason we put it on a hot plate or we put it into an ice bath or something, it would still give us a reading and that that reading would be accurate. Uh, that this is our kind of region for which we have an open mind about the experiment uh, of measuring the temperature of something with this particular thermometer. And then the region where we have given no probability is where our mind is closed, where we do not admit that it is even logically possible for you know, a human being's temperature, once measured with a thermometer, to be 5,000. It is simply outside of our acceptable realm of discourse. And so going back to the, the, the idea of two people uh, conversing, when we talk about two people with, with different opinions and open minds, for which they share some degree, some region of an expected value of an experiment for which they both accept it as possible. That is where we can then, that, that is basically the region or the, the evidence that we have that we can work with to resolving disagreements between the two of us. In the areas where our mind is not open, where we do not admit logical possible outcomes can occur is areas where we cannot resolve our, our difference and for which we are not able to use this particular relationship to guide us. 
it may also be worth mentioning that this particular distribution, and if we find some value that is very extreme on it, that we may uh, always want to leave some uh, kind of fuzziness or some level of doubt that the particular reading is inaccurate rather than the theory behind it. So that the, the idea of how temperature works is not in question if we get a bad reading from a thermometer 5,000 degrees, we can be reasonably confident that it's the thermometer itself that is broken. Using this, and to the extent we are going to hopefully get into it in a bit, uh, we want to collect information until the value of not collecting information has equal expected value is the value of collecting more information. So if you have strong beliefs about a parameter, if you have strong prior belief of something, you'll probably stop collecting information sooner. And you can observe this in practice if you've ever found someone who's gotten into an argument online. Because chances are, what they do is they are convinced of their own opinion, and so they go to Google, or they go to DuckDuckGo, and they, they look to see and to double check, just in case, you know, they, they, they're not correct. And so they just double check and they, they go and find some confirming evidence. And of course, it's confirmation bias to assume that that's always the, the, the evidence that you need. But usually you just stop after finding one thing. Because what you're doing is you're reasonably confident about your prior belief. And your, the, the, the update you need is going to be of very low value because there's not going to be much more certainty you can add uh, so that you're probably not going to look for information if it confirms you. But if it doesn't confirm your belief, you should, at least, uh, dig deeper at that point because you will find that you have more to gain because if, if you have negative information, or, or at least information that disproves strongly held beliefs, then it, information that can confirms strongly held beliefs. Another thing that kind of falls out of this by default is that uh, when you construct an experiment, you have your prior belief of the validity of the experiment, and you have the prior belief of your particular hypothesis within it. Uh, but that is going to be what guides you in producing the, the particular conditions of the experiment. And it's going to be distressing and stressful because you're, to the extent that this can prove or this can change your prior beliefs, is the extent to which you're kind of left in, in exposed by your experiment. And your, your belief may be forced to change by your experiment. And to the extent that this kind of outcome can happen, it may have costs. And it, your, your, your opinions may have to change. And in particular, your actions may have to change because your actions are guided by your opinions. And to the extent that your actions have to change are going to determine some level of stress, which in turn is going to imply some level of stress and tension in the differences of your own opinion, which in turn are going to define stresses and costs to the conditions of the experiment. And so to that extent, it is going to be stressful thinking about this, these experiments that you conduct. And the authors of the paper were kind of discussing how this may be part of the reason why Bayesian statistics was avoided in the first place, because it does not ignore this stress, and it forces you to kind of acknowledge it. There's kind of a saying sometimes that's you know, along the lines of, you know, just give me the facts. Only give me the facts. Give me only, you know, this certain information. But to derive certain information from these to imperfect information, you need a, an experiment that produces a certainty as a result. And you cannot produce 100% certainty from 
a non-100% value multiplied by a non-100% value divided by a non-100% value. You are simply not going to get that. And so right off the bat, this is not going to give you certainty. It's not going to give you facts. It's going to give you opinions, consistent opinions, opinions you can act on, opinions that are valuable and not valuable, valuable in relation to other opinions and not valuable in relation to other opinions, expected to give you a profit, not expected to give you a profit, but it is not going to give you facts. Something that comes up in calculations all the time in this area is the idea of variance. And so variance is important in statistics and in Bayesian statistics. There is no exception. Uh, it is simply calculated as follows. One over the standard deviation squared. Simple enough. Of course, you're not actually going to know the the variance by definition. You're going to have some idea of the variance. And you're not even going to necessarily know the, the mean or the value that you're trying to estimate. You're only going to know some approximation to it. And the question is, how do these how does an experiment change your estimation of both your amount and variance? And without going into too much of the details of how they derive it, uh, it is as follows. of the value you're trying to estimate is going to be equal to the variance that you started with times your estimation that you started with added to the experiment or your experimental result right, your that when you go and do the experiment to find that value you read your voltmeter you read your instrument and then the variance of the experiment itself your initial estimation of the variance plus the estimation of the experiment itself. And your updated estimation of the variance is going to be your prior estimation of the variance plus the variance that you see in the experiment. And notice that this is going to increase the variance if your variance is uh, not active to begin with. Or perhaps even if it's in, if it is. So your estimation of variance is going to continue to increase, and uh, your estimation of your result should continue to, to get more accurate. Now, they're going to kind of discuss it, a lot of uh, ways of approximating things in this area, and we're not going to go very much into detail on very many of them, because uh, we, we there's probably better ways that have been developed since of approximating these, these, these ideas and these quantities, and so we don't want to kind of waste too much time on them. But uh, one that might be worth thinking about is that the, to some approximation, your expected value from an experiment is going to be approximately uh, the mean of a set of experiment or a set of results of that experiment. I think there's a central limit theorem or something that suggests this, uh, where basically you're, you're, you know, if, you, if you pull a whole bunch of values, the, on average, the, the, the mean of the values you'll, you pull is closest to the actual expected value that you start with. And the expected variance is 
approximately the number of trials in your experiment divided by the uh, estimated variance squared. Kind of a useful thing to know. It's, it's a basic idea. If you have a two to one odds, it means you have twice the, 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 the probability uh, of you know, something coming up. If you have a you know, one to six odds, you have a uh, you know, you're rolling six sided dice, you know, one in six chance something's going to come up, or you know, six, six to one is, 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 is roughly along those lines. You know, a two to one odds is you know, you're choosing between a red and a blue uh, option. Uh, or you know, something like roulette, where you have red and black, and it's a two to one odds, and the payoff is two to one. And so the odds are going to be defined as. Uh, of something divided by 1 minus the negation of that probability of something. So you have you know, two possible outcomes. Probability is 1 and 2. Probability of the not option, so in red and black, is also 1 and 2. Be, you know, of two possible outcomes, the probability the odds are one, or one to one. This is expressed as a ratio of one to some odd. Now, the kind of claim invasion inference is that the odds expre express everything about that data, or all the information about the data, or all the information that that data carries can be expressed in terms of odds. Going back to you know, our, our conditional probability, B, what is the odds of A given B? So our little omega is going to stand for our odds function. simply going to be the probability of a given, d, a given B divided by the probability that not A given B. Enough. Now this is going to in turn stand for 
going to be related by a distribution function. So if we give it a lambda and an internal variable for counting divided by this integral of this b distribution of b given lambda or lambda multiplied by another distribution u of lambda given the not mu, so kind of the opposite of the opposite. Iterate with the lambda, which is going to define this kind of L function, which is going to basically give us uh, how much information is gained. A rate th this is going to express for us a ratio that allows us to calculate the prop or the odds of A given B given the odds of A. And so this is basically just going to be kind of an accounting thing. So we're going to start with our prior belief of the odds of A. And the conditions of the experiment by this ugly integral here are going to define for us some benefit function, the, the amount of information gained, and to what extent our odds are changing given this particular experiment we're conducting is going to tell us our new odds. And you can you can kind of drive this or drive that integral well, however you, know, you, you want to go back and look at where this comes from, but that it's not too unreasonable to, to imagine given the previous you know, basic phase rule uh, that there should be something, some ratio, some value tying together the prior belief of some hypothesis. And the belief in that hypothesis given new data. So that is what that is going to give us. This is a subjective value. It is a ratio of conditional probability. Now, if this is only with one experiment. As you conduct multiple experiments, multiple of these curl functions are going to be applied to your initial odds to generate a resulting set of odds. That depends on not just one set of data, but multiple sets of data. As an example, suppose you have a dice in front of you, and you believe this is a normal dice, uh, but your friend that perhaps you're playing Dungeons and Dragons with is playing a joke on you or something, and it tells you that this is actually a loaded dice. It comes up one more often, perhaps. It is a, you know, the probability of rolling a six on this dice is actually only one in five, rather one in six, rather than the one in six that you would expect. And so you realistically have a difference of opinion with this person. And so you disagree with them whether it's fair. And so the likelihood given that the dice is fair, that a 6 comes up, is 1 over 6. And the ratio between whether that comes up on a fair dice and whether it comes up on their supposed unfair dice is 1 in 6 divided by 1 in 5. Or about 5 over 6. And so this, this ratio is going to be this, this ratio of conditional probabilities is actually this L function right here. For the instance, for the, for the case that you roll a 6. Now for the case where you roll something other than 6, the probability given a fair dice is 5 over 6, and the probability of an unfair dice in this case is 4 over 5. See that, but the 5 over 6 divided by 4 over 5 
turns out to be, and we'll skip ahead in the math a bit here, uh, 25 over 24. I think I misspoke there. I said that it was the probability of them being divided. It's actually a ratio of conditional probabilities, which is why this is not a probability in itself. It is a ratio of probabilities, and it just happens to be over 1. That is okay. Uh, it is going to, because, you, again, these are not probabilities that we're dealing with, they're odds. And odds can be very high, they can be very low. But this is the L that we're going to get if we roll the dice and it comes up something other than 6. And so we're going to, after a number of rolls, perhaps a very large number of rolls, if we're really, you know, interested in finding this out, we're going to come up with some number times our initial number. X is the number of rolls that came up fair, and Y is the number of rolls that came up confirming our unfair beliefs. So it's going to be 5 over 6 to the power of whatever number of 6s times 25 over 4 to whatever the number of non-6 rolls times our additional odds. But this is interesting because this is going to be uh, some... If we have... Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to test this in terms of a fair roll. So if we assume that it's fair, then on average, the sixth, so n over six of our rolls, where n is the number of rolls, are going to come out six. And they're going to confirm our belief by this much. And n over, or five n over six times, they're going to confirm both and they're going to add this 25 over 4 to our belief. But this can be simplified, because if we take the n out, come up with this 5 over 6 to the power of 1 over 6, 25 over 24 to the power of 5 over 6, to the power of n. But these are all just numbers. You can actually do that math, and they did in this paper, so. That turns out to be a single number, and it turns out to be about 1.0001. the power of n, which turns out to be, simplifying it to perhaps a, a more human number, about 10, the power of 0 0.00158 times 10. And this is going to be the number that we multiply that if our roll is fair, we're going to multiply n as the number of trials, and that's going to give it a kind of an expected amount of change in our odds. So if we you know, have n is 1,200, we're going to look at 1,200 times 0 0.00158. Uh, it's going to be some number, 10 to that number. It's about 77 to 1. So that is going to tell us 
if if we just start rolling, and every time we hit a six, we multiply our initial belief by five over six. And every time we get a five, or a four, or three, two, or one, we multiply our, our initial belief by 25 over 24. We, we update our odds. After 1,200 rolls, we would expect our, our odds to be 77 to 1, or thereabouts. Might be slightly above, slightly below, but we'd expect 1,200 is probably not going to be very much variance from this number. And so for at least choices between two hypotheses that you can kind of relate to that scenario, that is how you can come up with how your tests change your odds, how your tests change your opinions. Also, the odds of A are going to be based only on one interpretation, and it's going to depend how much it costs to make a bet in terms of whether or not you would make that bet. So, it's going to depend on how much it costs you to make a roll, to roll another trial, is going to determine whether you make that other roll. Now, if you've got 1,200, the difference between 1,200 and 1,201 is not going to be a very big change in your odds. It's still going to be roughly 77. Whereas the difference between one roll and 1,200 roll is going to be between, well, whatever you start out with, and you know, 77 to 1. So it's going to be between um, five and six, or something like that, and which will probably be one and one compared to fair, fair to non. So you're gaining a, a, you know, 77 times as much certainty uh, by taking 1,200 units. And so, what is it worth it for you to know to 77 to one odds? Well, the, the question is, how much are you betting that this 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 dice is? is loaded. You know, if you're betting two dollars on it at fair odds, then, you know, you, you can keep rolling and, you know, whenever your next roll costs less than the expected value of how much, however much odds you're getting, uh, you know, relative to the marginal value in dollars of your odds and the marginal value in utility of dollars, that's when you keep rolling, is when that utility is positive. It's also critical, absolutely critical, that your odds don't depend on your experiment. And so, you know, if you have a dice that can read your mind and flips to one if you're, you know, conducting an experiment. This is not the case when this is going to apply. You know, any, anywhere where the fact that you're doing the experiment can change the experiment itself, you, know, you actually have to do something of a meta-experiment to control that. We're not going to get into that here. But you can kind of figure out how that would go. It's worth defining two uh, new kind of values or variables. I, which is the value in dollars that you would place on some A being true, perhaps this dice, and you're betting two dollars that it's fair, then the value of I is two. And J is the value that it is not true. So this is the, you know, maybe you're hedging your bets, you're betting two dollars that it's true and two, you know, a dollar that it's not true. And there's a relationship. which is J divided by I, so the ratio of the benefits you get from both of them, or rather the ratio of the benefit you get from A being true, divided by the ratio, or the, the value you get from A being false, 
divided by the odds of A. But this L function has to be more valuable than this difference. If it is more valuable, then it is worth conducting an experiment. Now, the information you gain from it is more valuable than the initial ratio of uh, your being correct and not being correct combined with the odds of your being correct. So if you find that you, you, know, you would gain from learning more, you should learn more. This is going to include also potentially the cost of the experiment. So if these are negatives, the, the value from the experiment minus the cost of the experiment, then this could also express that as well. It's worth pointing out that, first of all, this is something that's fairly new. Uh, you could potentially derive it from, pre from frequentist statistics, but it's not very intuitive to do so. And if you had to derive it from frequentist statistics, you would probably end up deriving most Bayesian statistics along with it. And so they're suggesting at least, and this is probably the core idea here, that you know th this is new. Th this, this tying of everything together, this entire context leading to this point, where this tells you whether to continue doing your experiment, whether the experiment must continue, this is what's going to tell you. By the way, you can get kind of a review of this uh, by Googling a technical ex explanation of a technical explanation by Eliezer uh, Yukowski. Uh, he walks through much of the same material, possibly better uh, described, uh, but uh, might be worth a Google. Uh, but th this is kind of all kind of at a you know, algebra level in terms of, you know, you're writing down equations to solve this, but you know, is there another way of looking at it? And is there another way of understanding the, this, this concept, this way of looking at things? And it turns out, of course, there is, which is graphical. And so suppose, again, we're going back to the, the, the thermometer or, 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 or even something relating to a, a disagreement that you have from some prior probability. start with, and then some other probability. Perhaps this is your, your measurement, uh, your um, perhaps a disagreement. This is your probability and your friend's probability for the same thing. And the question is, how do you combine these two? And so you can interpret this as the probability. So you have some domain that your distribution is on, and you have some value x that you're potentially considering as a result. And the question is, what is the probability of lambda, some value, given x? So if you, before you look at your thermometer, what is the probability of your temperature? Given a reading of a thermometer of x, for each temperature. 
So you may have this, you know, for for some experiment, you may not really, you know, for one roll of, of the dice, for one reading of the thermometer when you're half awake, it's probably going to be hazily defined, let's say in this case. And so you're going to distribute probability. Remember, all of this has to head to one. Uh, among all possibilities uh, to begin with. The prior is very general in this case. This is the probability of your value given a reading mass. And then the thermometer itself is going to have a probability of X coming up. This is going to basically be the accuracy curve of the thermometer, or perhaps this is your friend's distribution. Now this is not going to be a probability of some value given X, this is going to be a probability of X. And we're going to eventually come up with a curve Now we may notice that something is going to look a little familiar here. So this is actually relatable by Bayes' rule, which is the probability of lambda given x is equal to times the probability of x divided by the probability of lambda. going to define us an actual value at every point in this curve. And so you're going to multiply these two curves together at every point. So you're going to look at the first point. And we don't have values to kind of compare it, so we're going to kind of eyeball it. But this is a small amount, and this is a small amount. So it's going to be an even smaller amount. But it's going to be multiplied by, or divided by, this uh, our first value. Now this is again can be uh, derived. So it's actually going to basically express how much volume we've gotten so far. And so it, it, it's going to express the, the it, it, it's just going to be kind of a, a balancing term to, to multiply our final curve by in general. So it's, it, and it's going to apply to the entire curve. So it's not going to necessarily uh, change the shape of the curve, it's just going to stretch it out. And so to start with, we're going to have a very small curve at one end. Because these two are being multiplied by each other. And then in the middle, it's going to kind of get larger as the larger areas get multiplied by each other and so on and so forth. And it's going to look, assuming our initial curves look like this, kind of something like this, where it's going to get scrunched together. It's going to be a narrower curve. The, 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 the standard deviation is going to shrink. The, our, our, our prediction is going to be a little bit more focused, given these two initial curves. If we had another experiment where we started with this, and we gave it another curve that was similar to it, our result, assuming that these two curves are nearby, it's going to look something like this. 
where each time we do an experiment where it agrees with previous experiment, or, or agrees with our product, uh, the, the probability is going to be kind of focused in the region of agreement. Anywhere where there's disagreement, the, the probability is going to be spread out over that area. Now, it's noteworthy, that kind of when looking at it this way, and I think we may have mentioned before, that it really screws you up if you uh, find a value in a region for which you are closed-minded. And so if, for example, you have your prior is going to be there, zero after this point, and it turns out that your experiment only suggests values in this area. This means that your prior is not only is your prior inaccurate, but you're unable to take into account this evidence. That you're unable to update your opinions in a consistent way. And that this falls outside of what you can reason about. And your entire model is not accepting it. So this is bad. This is this is unacceptable because you're not using new information. And worse, it, it's suggesting that your existing information is wrong in some respect. So, the kind of take, taking another kind of step in the direction of testing hypotheses, uh, the question of, you know, what decision or which decision do you make, going back a little bit, depends on what's at stake. It depends on the cost of your doing so. Uh, an example given, uh, not in the paper, but just sort of a recent one, uh, is there's a commercial that suggests, uh, you know, would you drive over a bridge that nine in ten engineers have suggested is unsafe? And the reasoning goes, of course, that you know if you wouldn't, then why would you continue to support stuff like Kinder Morgan uh, in their efforts to allow people to burn fossil fuel easier when nine out of ten Climatologists suggest that radical action is needed for climate change and to remedy that particular situation. Uh, and that particular kind of view or that partic particular frame uh, expresses the costs of not acting or the costs of acting. So you have not only two kind of alternative competing hypotheses, the difference between you know, man made climate change and not, but also the costs involved. And so there's some relationship between the costs of believing in either of those two alternatives and not, and that relationship is given here, is in uh, the, the relationship between I and J is given previously. So another example is if you're given the choice between two teaching methods, for example, a video like this, and perhaps Khan Academy similar kind of video, and you want to know which one to, you should be funding, I'll give you a hint, it's Khan Academy, uh, the question is, you know, at what point do you do that? Well, you can you can do an experiment, let's say you can watch a video of each, maybe this video and one of this, and uh, you can come up with a ratio of uh, some probability of which one is better and by how much. You can come up with an L. And the, the question of you know, which one are you going to support is going to depend on the cost of both, again, that your I and J functions, and the difference in probability between which method is actually, you know, which hypothesis has more certainty, which, what, what is the, the, the degree of certain, what are the odds between these two methods. And so, you know, we're going to then use those odds to determine at what point does it make sense to bet on one rather than the other. And you will then use the, the answer to that question to determine which ends up getting funding and which one is your choice. 
The second example given is that of ESP, and extrasensory perception, which viewed from the context of the 60s is this ridiculous idea of being able to change things with your mind alone, or being able to sense things with your mind alone, without being able to you know, sense by your sensory perception, you know, your body, etc. Now, the prior probability is so far off the scale as to still be permissible, but being so long that even if you have a test, you have an outcome of your test that radically increases its probability, that you still end up with something that has a very low probability afterwards. So. The third example given is that of a suitcase, where if you are weighing your suitcase with a scale, you're going to be asking whether or not you want to take this suitcase on with you to an airport or something like that. And in from the frequentist perspective, uh, all you're really concerned about is whether or not your suitcase weighs less than 40 pounds. You can do a t-test to determine that. But from the Bayesian perspective, the cost of doing, of taking the suitcase is going to kind of color your perception of uh, whether or not to take it. So, for example, this will be what the cost function is going to look like. It's going to be around 40 pounds, not necessarily exactly, because their machines are going to be you know, ineffective at weighing just as yours is. So, you know, at some level, you're going to get billed, although it may not be exactly 40. And then your machine is going to have a distribution of given 40 pounds, or given your machine reading 40 pounds, or given what your machine reads, what probability you actually have 40 pounds. It's going to be a potentially normal distributed um, kind of function. Uh, and it turns out in this case that there is a kind of test you can do, and at this point I'm hopefully going to you know, provide a handout of sorts, a link to a t-test table, so you can look this up yourself. Here you have your value you weigh out, minus 40, divided by your standard deviation of your you come up with is what you're going to then, you know, using this table, come up with a, a value for that. But this is going to be your key value that you plug into it. And it turns out if this is greater than about four, you are basically justified in expecting that your distribution is not actually normal. Uh, it is not a normal curve, so you can then use some other distribution to, to look at it. But you're, you're end going to end up with a one-tailed result on this t-table. And uh, it turns out, this is one of the things that was kind of surprising by the 60s, that there's a lot of cases where these one-tailed uh, results are useful in Bayesian inference, but they weren't aware of a single one where both tails were involved. Whereas in frequentist statistics, you end up doing one, one tail sometimes, two tails sometimes. But at least in this case, you can probably forget about all the one tail stuff, just focus on how to do this you know, t-table uh, or t-test stuff in the, with one tail. But we're not going to get into the details of that. I'm going to assume if you know it, you know it. If you don't, I'm going to go and look it up. Uh, another question is, what do you do if you are trying to estimate many parameters? And so if you have a function, say, of three variables, and you want to find out each of these variables, or the, you know, you're, you're trying to you know, discern the, the, these three properties of your, your system, you're trying to learn these three things that are interrelated in some way. And their suggestion to do so is to find the distribution of the function itself, of the combination of the joint distribution of these parameters, and then once you have that, 
find the marginal distribution of each as you go. If you can get a joint distribution, so if you can find S distribution, N observations, your unknown mean and standard deviation, should give you, uh, if you observe uh, enough So if, you're, if your observation is high enough, and you observe enough to estimate the mean and standard deviation, you're going to end up with the one of your standard deviation. And the combination of these two is going to allow you to approximate your actual, uh, your, your actual mean that you're, you're trying to estimate. If you don't have a distribution, or re and then their suggestion is that you the median of the sample uh, is approximately. Ahead of myself. So th this is, if you can find this distribution, you can use these uh, based on removing this lawn uh, of your standard deviation. Ba basically, there is a way to combine these two. I'm not going to go into the way to combine these two, but the, you, you can basically, from this point, get to it if you look hard enough. Uh, if you do not have a distribution, so you can't find the distribution of that, uh, you need something called non-parametric statistics, which up until the early 60s was well developed in frequent this land, uh, but as of that point, nobody had ported it over to Bayesian statistics. Uh, they were cautiously optimistic of that believing that it would work and it would continue to uh, uh, confirm, you know, add information, add value to them, uh, but nobody had done it yet. I'm assuming by this point someone has. You, know, you, you may want to go Google that to go find it to confirm it, because otherwise that's probably really low-hanging fruit. Uh, but they suggested that uh, the median of the sample is approximately the median of an unknown distribution. And the mean of the sample is approximately the mean of the unknown distribution. If I said that right, the median of the sample is the median of the distribution. The mean of the sample is the mean of the distribution, or approximately. Uh, e not necessarily equal to, because you don't know the distribution, because you don't have some parametric equation that uh, relates them. But the question is, is that if it's an even bet that the median is greater than the mean, similarly that the mean is greater than the median, it's a one, one to one bet, an even bet. But what happens if it's not an even bet? And that's the question that they kind of left to you. And given you know how to change your perception of odds, given experiment, you should be able to figure that out. Uh, they argue that humans do not get as much information out of their observations as is warranted uh, in general. So if you provide someone with you know, the probability of your experiment happening, you basically feed people the information that they should be plugging into Bayes' rule. They generally don't use Bayes' rule, and they generally don't infer using Bayesian inference, so they generally don't get as much uh, out of their information as, uh, logically speaking, the information they have gives them. Uh, again, the next video is going to be all about that. Another point to make is that uh, frequentist statistics stresses the interval when making observations rather than the data point in question. 
Now supposing we have some distribution available to us, the entirety of the volume under this curve is going to add to 1. But if we want, for example, a 95% interval, we can select at around, say, the mean. We could do that. But there's no reason for us to do that. And sometimes you want to do it around the mean. Sometimes you want to do it around the median. Sometimes you want some degree of symmetry. So you want some relationship between the shape of the curve and the part of the curve that you're driving. Sometimes you have peaks in your curve. And you want to kind of maximize the number of peaks that your region has. And sometimes you want to have the smallest interval. Perhaps it costs something to test each part of the interval, so you want to you know, choose what part of the interval is smallest and is worth considering as a 95% chance. And so there, it is possible to define these intervals in terms of your distribution. But the question is, well, why would you do it? And maybe there are some answers like the, you know, the cost of doing an experiment. But the design of the experiment itself doesn't have to, you know, doesn't necessarily have to uh, operate under that assumption. You, know, you, you could design an experiment with the entire distribution in mind. Of course, you can't always do that, but sometimes you can. Also point we're pointing out is once something, again, to reiterate, once something is rendered impossible, no further observations can quote-unquote retrieve it. Um, this guides experiment design. Uh, so you're, for example, testing against impossible null hypotheses is basically silly. Again, just make sure that it is, you know, your silly null hypothesis is in fact impossible. There's a quote that I want to read from the paper that I think is worth reading. Quote, classical statistics tends to divert attention from A to the two conditional probabilities of making errors by guessing A when A obtains and vice versa. The counterpart of the probabilities of these two kind of errors are in general more problems or are in more general problems is called the operating characteristic and classical or st statisticians suggest an effect that you should choose among the available operating characteristics as a method of choosing A or more generally, your prior, di prior distribution. This is not math mathematically wrong, but it distracts attention from your value judgments and opinions about the unknown facts upon which your preferred A should directly depend without regard to how the probabilities of errors vary with A in a special or in a specific experiment. In other words, your, pre your preconceptions poison your results, and they poison your results for both frequentists and Bayesians. But in the Bayesian case, you can see it as it is happening. And that makes all the difference. It's worth pointing out that if your preconception is very general, and your data point is very specific, your resulting belief is going to be very specific. And vice versa, if your, your belief is very specific and your result is very general, your end result is going to be very specific, so long as they agree. But if your data point is general, and your belief is general, your result is going to be pretty general, too. 
on average, it's going to be about as general. If they agree, if the general spots agree, you'll be a little bit more certain, your certainty will be a little bit more focused. But in general, if your belief is kind of, in general, if your prior belief is general and your experimental result is general, you don't really gain much. You might gain a little, but you don't get much information. You don't get much value out of it. Your bets don't change. Your utility of what you would get off of a bet doesn't change. You don't get much out of it. There's different distributions are going to have different um, not only approximations, but you may actually be able, able to do better than just an approximation. You'll be able to use the, the way that the distribution is constructed to come up with the prior probability. And so one example is uh, perhaps some kind of a test, uh, maybe a motor skill test that favors either the left or the right side of a particular line. Uh, you can view a null hypothesis, again, using frequentist terms, uh, but it turns out it's okay in this condition. But the density of the parameter uh, sort of sharply concentrated in some region. Uh, otherwise, it's widely distributed among zero and one. In other words, you're basically testing whether something is true, or if there's some effect, or if there's no relationship at all. And in N trials, See that? Uh, it's going to combinate for um, the combination of uh, n given r times probability times 1 minus probability power of n minus r in n trials. And if the quote unquote null hypothesis holds, basically the same equation with the zero in the place of p. So it's a combination of n given r times your kind of perceived effective p zero power of r times one minus p zero power of n minus r. And uh, however this allows us to uh, well, the question is what is our L function 
basically going to be the that this this ratio defined without this combination function based on this new function here that is going to be kind of the marginal of, of gain or the, that's going to depend on this p0 and it's going to also depend on of which of the uh, hypotheses I guess determine it. Now the benefit of this is that you don't need to calculate this combination, which turns out to be kind of difficult to calculate and uh, kind of hard to uh, to derive, etc. The hard part is this integration, here. and there are different ways of breaking it apart. Again, we're not going to go into it, but uh, it is possible to kind of break it apart, and uh, in real situations to break it apart. And the better you can approximate this, the the better, at least in, in these very newly cases, you can do. Now it's worth pointing out that this p to the power of r times 1 minus p to the power of n minus r uh, has a maximum. that p is equal to the ratio of r over n. This tells us that if we're looking for a p0, then the kind of optimal one we're going to find is kind of the number of right guesses we have over the number of total guesses is going to determine our probability. At that point, uh, we've kind of reached kind of a local maximum. And so using that, you can derive a minimum value you can get. I'm not going to do the, the math to find it. But you can find a point where no experiment given your difference of odds can give you more information, or at least given the cost of the experiment. Also worth pointing out here, and I'll, this will be where the second handout is, is there's a relationship between these tall functions and key tables. And there's a nice chart they have in the initial paper that I guess describes if you have a one in a, t a value in a key table, how much information you're gaining by a result that gives you that, that particular result, etc. Uh, also described in the paper are chi uh, squared distributions and f distributions, which what they describe at least uh, is that uh, they are kind of, at least as of the 60s, were spooky for both Bayesians and frequentists and not exactly well understood. And that the grounding or, or rather the results you would get from them tended to be good, but the deep understanding of why they worked wasn't as wide, what, what wasn't very widespread. And so it was kind of ad hoc at the time. This may have changed, I don't know, but it's, it's worth considering if you, if you use chi squared uh, distributions at all, uh, that you know, there may be an equivalent in the Bayesian uh, world that is better or not, but it, it's not very well uh, grounded. But in practice what you end up doing is you're testing against many hypotheses at once. You can see something like this today at Google Correlate in Google Labs where you're basically testing a whole bunch of different hypotheses at once to see what sticks. In general, uh, if you have n-dimensional problems along these lines, uh, analytic solutions tend not to exist, but you can uh, use approximations. Again, you know, if you're dealing with this, you can see how the, the integral might kind of explode on you for an n-dimensional case. But the approximations, to the extent that they're accurate, allow you to be accurate in your resulting analysis.
There's also... For a partition of H, maybe, that if there's a constant that relates the potential uh, or the probability of T given H with not V given H, If the two are related by a constant for all partitions H, then D and D kind, or D and some alternative D, are of equal importance. And likewise, if they're not, they're not of equal importance. And it's worth pointing out that H can be multidimensional. This is not merely a two-dimensional only draw in two dimensions, but H can be a, can exist, can can live uh, among a, a, a wide dis number of distributions in many dimensions. However, so long as all probabilities of D and D prime given H or H I, i.e. that particular partition of potential D and D primes, as long as, it, as they are related by a single constant, then D and D prime are of equal importance. This gives us the ability to say, in the frequentist world, you test until your data is enough to prove your point, and then you stop. In the Bayesian world, you stop at some point because maybe you're tired, maybe you don't really care anymore, maybe your L function is not really giving you anything for it. And as long as you're, the reason that you stop is not related to the data, you have to be careful about that, your resulting odds still tell you something, and they tell you how, how good your data at least suggests uh, your, your resulting opinion should be. And it's worth pointing out, quote, rules which have a non-zero probability of running forever ought not and hence will not be called stopping rules at all. I.e., if you have to continue your frequentist test to get enough data to prove your point, and if you have to just keep grabbing resulting, you know, keep grabbing data, you know, bring it back to the argument on the internet example. If you're in an argument on the internet, and you have to keep Googling, you have to keep looking to so for something to prove your point, and there is no stopping rule, then you are effectively not governed by any rule at all. Or rather, you are not governed by any process, because the process will never end, potentially. Whereas, at least in the Bayesian side, you can define an ending point. That point may just be that you're tired and don't, don't want to look anymore, or that you've expended as much energy being rational as you possibly want, then at least there is a stopping rule based on that. This is not a trivial point. Uh, you really don't know when to stop in the frequentist world. You don't know when to stop researching. You don't know when to stop confirming your bias. But at least you do know that you can stop. You do know that you 
when you do stop, how certain you are. Or, or at least, to what degree your belief is, is justified. And I personally have fallen into this trap where I've had decade-long arguments and decade-long quests for knowledge, when I should probably have admitted, at least to some extent, that it is possible that I was mistaken. Quote, according to the likelihood principle, or this, data analysis stands on its own feet. So, if you accept this, the rest of the Bayesian inference kind of is justified on its own. Of course, if you don't accept it, it isn't justified, but hopefully you have some reason, you know, in this video and other material to accept it. But, uh, and that you can do some of this math and some of the equations leading up to it and approximate it quite well with Markov chains. But again, that's kind of outside of the scope of this video. So, kind of leading up to the point, which is the idea I'm trying to get across here, which is that this is not just some tool. This is, these are not just some equations. You can probably forget these equations. You can probably forget some of the, the ideas here. But the approach of treating evidence based on Bayes' rule was a fundamentally new way of looking at science, a new way of approaching reason discourse, disagreement, experiment. Quote, adoption of the Bayesian outlook should discourage creating statistical procedures, Bayesian or other, as symbols of respectability pretending to give the imprimatur, or imprimatur of mathematical logic to the subject of process of empirical inference. So in other words, the use of statistics to give authority is looked down upon here. Quote, Estimation is best when it is stable. Rejection of a null hypothesis, or a null hypothesis is best when it's interocular. In other words, when you are in agreement with your estimation, and when your estimation continues to uh, affirm what you're doing, you can probably you know, stop at that point. But a rejection of a you know, belief, a, a evidence that you are incorrect, should be investigated greatly. So, uh, that's pretty much the paper in its entirety. Uh, I'm not going to summarize the equations here, but I just want to, you know, they, they, they've kind of summarized it well enough a little bit as is. The basic idea of treating odds as being connected to what you would bet, and in terms of what your bets are worth in utility to you, that there is this one-to-one -one correspondence that your i, your j, functions are definable, that this implies what your experiment should be like, whether to do your experiment, all of these things. This is a new way of looking at science, kind of a new kind of science. And hopefully this is the beginning of your use of it. If, you, if I've made any mistakes in this video, please, of course, tell me. I'm interested in learning. This is probably the place to, to uh, put your, your stake in the stand if there's a problem with any of this. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, this, this outlook is valuable to you. Again, I'm Jeff Cliff. This is Ben. And ideas, 50 years. See you next uh, video when we discuss NORAD.